coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The hunt test takes elements of duck hunting to see the skills that are necessary to be a successful hunting dog. There are not many sites like this for spoonbills and egrets to nest in. People plant invasive species not even realizing that they will create a problem in the ecosystem. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. It's Friday afternoon in the Houston Medical Center, and Ruby Rubin is just heading into work. Good girl. No, that's not Ruby. That's Ruby. She starts her shift by greeting her co-workers. How are you doing today? She puts on her <laughs> ID bag. And before long, she's out making the rounds. Hello. This is Ruby. Yes, Hi, Ruby. <laughs> Ruby's seven years old. She's a Labrador retriever. She's here to lift the spirits of patients on a job which might include a game of fetch. Hey, you go. It's a treat for patients and work for Ruby, but it's a job she loves. Good to see you again. Ruby. This work requires her to be obedient and disciplined, qualities that she learned from her handler, Dorothy Ruman. I got into dogs because a two-year-old chocolate Labrador came with the package when I got married. We'd go hunting a lot, and every time I'd shoot a bird, his dog would take my bird to him. And I didn't like that, so I wanted my own dog to bring my own bird to me. And so I purchased my own puppy and came home and trained her and had my first gun dog. The hunting season is so short, I decided I wanted to do competitions with them. Dorothy trained two other competition dogs before adopting a very special black lab named Cole. Cole was my soulmate. She gave me a platform and she gave me a name in our sport. Ruby was her little sister and she raised Ruby and Ruby worshipped her. It was Cole who first taught Ruby what being a champion is all about. We have these great dogs. They're wonderful gifts. And we enjoy taking them out and, and using them for what they're bred to do. Fetch. Good girl. Very good. So in your own house, you have an obstacle course heel. Very nice. Good. Drop. That's it right there. Ruby Long. trains in the field most weekends. Ruby. And practices those skills at home. That's it. Very good. Ruby. So who says you can't train in a subdivision? <laughs> Ruby. It's a talent nice. that runs in the family. Dixie. Ruby's little sister, Dixie, is Sit. just learning Ruby. the basics. Sit. Sit. Here. Heel. Sit. Sit, whoops, I dropped one. Leave it. They have to sit for hours and they can't move. And that icy water when you're duck hunting, that's the beginning and the foundation of all of her training right there. The dog's training will be pushed to the limits at the Master National Retriever Competition being held this year at the Big Woods on the Trinity, also known as Doc McFarling's Place. What a hunt test does is it takes elements of duck hunting and takes it to a schematized level. We can design technical ponds to see the skills that are necessary to be a successful hunting dog in a sort of a compact and shorter time frame. Over 800 dogs compete here from all over the nation. These dogs are the elite of the sport, having qualified at other regional hunt tests. But the whole event has a spirit of encouragement and good nature. Because the dogs don't compete against each other, they compete against a standard. It's a pass-fail test in a series of increasing difficulty over eight days with one goal. Always bring back the bird. Now it's Ruby's turn. She watches closely as the marks are set. When she has her eye on the right mark, Dorothy gives her the cue.
It's a clean retrieve. Next, they aim for the live flyer. Ruby heads for the spot just where the bird came down, but there's a problem. The bird is not there. Dorothy gives the signal to start searching, boxing the area until Ruby picks up the scent. She still hasn't found the bird. Dorothy is worried. Where is this silly thing? Ruby is getting tired and starting to overheat in the afternoon Texas sun. If Ruby returns without a bird, it's all over. I just boxed that whole area. I just don't know where it is. This flyer has turned into a runner, and a simple retrieve is now a game of hide and seek. I can give her one more back and try one more time. <laughs> it moved. Well. Ruby finds the flyer, but she's exhausted and overheating. The judges give her a break to cool off. After a short rest and some water, Ruby goes for it and brings back the last two birds clean. It's a successful run, but it's taken a physical toll on Ruby. She got hot. Immediately, the judges said, put this dog in an air-conditioned vehicle and get her off the grounds. And so we came straight back, and she spent the whole afternoon on the bed. But this isn't the first time Ruby has felt a little down. For several months, uh, Ruby used to have dreams and she used to cry. I knew she was mourning for Cole. We lost her to hemangiosarcoma, and it's a cancer that, um, that sets on very quickly. We had 10 and a half years with her, and that was a blessing. She was a once-in-a-lifetime dog. After Cole died, a big hole was in our heart. We ran the week after with Ruby, and it was so amazing. She turned on. She ran a perfect series. It was like Ruby was running for Cole. She was always the sidekick. Now she was top dog, and she could shine to her fullest, and she did. After a good night's sleep, Ruby is back in the field to show off what she can do. Heel, that's it. Close. That's it. Ruby! It's a flawless run that helps her secure yet another Master National title. But all the honors, awards, and trophies are no replacement for a quiet morning with the family and a real duck hunt. There are no judges or spectators here. Right here. Here. Hunting to us is a fun time to get out with the family, and we just get to put our hair down and just relax. As a trainer, I ask a lot of all of our dogs. This is kind of our reward because she's paid her dues. Let them run, let them do what they're bred to do. There they are. Go. The go. dogs love it because it's a new experience every time you go out. It feels great to get a few ducks, and that's icing on the cake. The family snags a few birds for dinner and heads home. Yeah. Fun. Fun hunt. It's just another day on the job for Ruby the she Retriever. Did. She had a very fun time. Here we go. The ball.
Oliver Flat Shorebird Sanctuary. Big group of birds over here. Let's go check them out. Oh, look at that flying in. Boom, cool. And if you watch that Dartmoor Fresh Eager, he's just running around. Looks like he's gonna fall over at times. It's kind of fun to watch. We're at Bolivar Flat Shorebird Sanctuary on Bolivar Peninsula in Galveston County. And this is a mecca for birds, for water birds, for shorebirds that use the Texas coast. Did you right see the stimmer? Going right down that very first wave. You can always go down to the beach and see anywhere from 15 to 30 species of birds, no matter whether it's in the spring or the hot summer time. And most of the time they'll be just like we're seeing right here. They'll be in little clumps. There are birds here for many reasons, for foraging, for roosting, and some are even here for nesting. This time of the year we've got least terns and willets. I see it. The least turn went back to the nest. Oh, good, there. good. Yes, excellent. You can see that it's pretty small, but notice the white forehead and the yellow bill. These are only turn that's going to have that very sharp, small yellow bill with that white forehead. The nesting birds here are very sensitive, and what we recommend is that you fish, swim, and play at 50 yards away. Keep your distance. Let the birds have some space. Look in the scope there, there's a baby great egret. You have to look through some wispy limbs. Oh, yeah. It's really pretty. Ooh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> the rookery here in Highland is unique because it allows bird watchers to get really close. Trails are carved for easy walking. There's platforms and viewing decks that make it really easy to set up your camera or your scope. <laughs> this here is the great egret. Notice the showy plumes on the back. They're very fluffy plumes that are used for display. Yeah, it's funny to see these spoonbills with their big clumsy spoonbills bring in sticks and gently weave them together to make a platform nest, and they're very meticulous. This rookery here is very important to a lot of these birds because it provides them protection with the water around it, and there are not many sites like this for spoonbills and egrets to nest in. Wow, it looks like it's painful. These guys are over a month old. They're going to fledge any minute. Look at that. Ooh, feeding away. So she can't carry food in her talons or in her beak, so she brings it back in her stomach, and they have to regurgitate it up to transfer the food to the babies. <laughs> they just finished the meal, you know. Most of the birds just finished the meal. <laughs> in the United States, this is probably the best one. And I heard probably the best in the whole world. <laughs> Every day I come here three hours, from 6.30 to 9.30, yeah. For over 10 years. And I've been here for more than 500 trips. I probably only get 100 good shots. So it means one shot, it takes five trips. <laughs> the coast is so rich with bird life. It's great birding year round, every day of the year. There's so many varied habitats and just so many neat birds. It's one of the number one hot spots in the country, if not the world, to see birds.
it sounds like some science fiction plot. Plant like that could take over the world. Uh, son, come on. We think they are friendly. We welcome them into our neighborhoods. And then... They're a little bit like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. They come in quietly, nobody really notices until all of a sudden they completely take over. Many boaters and swimmers have tangled with invasive plants in the water, but the invasion of non-native plants by land may be easier to miss. Oh, yeah, look at all of them. Unless you know what to look for. And that's the problem right there. Exotic landscape plants are escaping our yards and invading natural areas. You can see that most of the plants out there, it's green and it's beautiful, but most of the plants out there are ligustrum. These plants quickly turn diverse woodlands into places where little else can grow. Here's a, the mature a ligustrum right here. And look at that trunk. Look at that, how many stems it has. It's slowly kind of spreading itself. And every foot and a half, you've got a new plant coming in. It's amazing how quickly it can just take over. If you look kind of up in the canopy or up above you, it's completely ligustrum. See how dense the shade is? Ligustrum always wins. With shade and sheer numbers, ligustrum, nandina, Chinese tallow, and others are outcompeting native plants. This definitely has a, a very strong impact on our ecology, which impacts our wildlife. Invaders do not provide food and shelter for wildlife, as well as native plants. But birds also unknowingly assist the invasion. This is what birds are now adapting to as their food supply. And of course, they're spreading it and recycling it and uh, planting more and more along our creeks. This must be how they propagate. There are millions of them. In West Texas, the growing menace is salt cedar. Brought to America as an ornamental and used for erosion control, salt cedar has wreaked havoc across the Southwest. Salt cedar invades very quickly. They drink up all of the water. They exude salt through the leaves. So it creates a monoculture. It's just not very good wildlife habitat. At Keystone Heritage Park in El Paso, a team works to restore the natural balance. One down, thousand to go. Oh, there's not enough ways to kill a salt cedar. So what we're trying to do is just remove the non-native plants and put back the natives in and uh, give it a little help here and there with the water. Yeah, it's about six feet. Salinity is 0.4%. It just needs a little jump start. Restoring this landscape's natural history is an extra challenge because of its human history. It's a combination of a natural wetland and a series of archaeological sites dating back to at least about 4,500 years. It's a challenge because we can't dig a hole without having an archaeologist present. We have to screen the dirt, make sure we're not digging into a site, and you can go probably 10 feet in any direction, you'll probably hit something. So you've got to be real careful. It's taking uh, quite a while, but uh, one step at a time. It's a very, very important site. Right. Yeah, if I wasn't hopeful about the future, I wouldn't be here doing this. But the battle against invasives, that's going to be going on for a long, long time. Back in Austin, another crew wages war on those exotic shrubs invading local parks. We'll have the professionals work with chainsaws, mowing equipment, and work with chippers. We use volunteers to help us with areas that we can't get to with machines. There you go. And they'll help us with cutting with hand tools and then dragging out. We've seen good results, so we're continuing to chip away at it, no pun intended, and uh, see what we can do in this area especially. It's just all over. Notice there's no grass, nothing but ligustrum, and so that's why we're doing this. On a Saturday morning, dozens of volunteers help the Austin Parks Foundation clear out invasives along Shoal Creek. If you can imagine having to do this with one or two people, it would take forever. All these people, we are just doing a big swath 
in record time. It's just amazing. In 20 years, they're all that will be left unless we take the weed wrench to them. So definitely worth the investment of time. It's coming. It really is a lot of hard work. And it's great exercise. We're evening up the score at this point. And uh, we may even be getting ahead of them. You got the stick. You got the stick. You know, if we can get many players all working together kind of collectively and really target specific areas, we can see a big change. Can you see a difference already? There must be some way of destroying this. There are various ways to remove exotic invasive species. Physical removal, burning during particular times of year, or even using herbicide. The best method of keeping invasives out of a landscape is to make the choice not to plant them in the first place. What we buy and plant directly impacts ecosystems. A lot of birds like to nest right down in the very center of those bunch grasses. So folks like Kelly work to make those impacts more positive. That switchgrass will hold the soil down and be a really Super. nice addition. We really encourage people to take a look at the tags on the containers and see that species are native to Texas and explore those plants that might be not only pretty, but also good for wildlife. It is more cost effective in the long oh, run. Those are going to look really nice. Obviously, you're going to save a lot of water if you don't have to water grass. And so by removing grass and adding understory trees and shrubs, you are going to have the beauty. It's easier to take care of. And then as your woodland matures, you have more and more wildlife. Kathy Nordstrom is a native plant landscaper. Hi. I was in the neighborhood. She helps homeowners transform their yards into wildscapes. Oh, Turk's cap looks great. It has really done well. And we were bored with the grass. Children had left home. We did not need to have a soccer field in our front yard any longer. And so this was our time to be innovative and do what we wanted to do. So this landscape of turf grass and exotic shrubs has become something more interesting for people and for wildlife. We're letting nature be a part of our lives instead of trying to regulate it so much. It gives you a good feeling that you've, you've done a little bit of something for the environment that a front lawn cannot do. Fortunately for all of us who enjoy nature, this alternative to planting invasive plants is catching on. Do they enjoy all the butterflies and the hummingbirds? It's that kind of a thing where people see it and then they want that for their own yard. What do we do when plants attack? You know, if we value natural places, if we value native wildlife species like chickadees and titmice, we have to remove some of those exotic species and let some of our native Texas plants take their place. Get to know the natives in your own area. That's the best advice I could give. A simple method had been found, preserving life on Earth. Mankind survived. To learn more about gardening with native plants in your area, visit the Texas Wildscape Program on our website. You can help support Texas Parks and Wildlife's big game conservation efforts through the Bighorn Sheep and White-Tailed Deer Conservation License Plate Program. Over $1.2 million has been generated from the sale of these plates, funding projects like chronic wasting disease research and containment, population and harvest surveys, and bighorn sheep and pronghorn restoration efforts. Every plate on a car, truck, or trailer means more money for big game in Texas.